the right way is always counterintuitive. Yeah. Otherwise, everyone would just be doing it, right? <laughs> That's so true. So Ken, you are a big fan of um, out of the box thinking. Um, can you elaborate on that? Well, it's actually a little more complicated than that. Hmm. You have to be out of the box and in the box at the same time. So um, maybe a good example is classical extreme programming which is done by what they call pair programming, right? You have two programmers. One of them types at the keyboard and writes code, and the other one thinks. So in my point of view, um, what's happening is to, to write good code, you have to really um, get into flow and focus on the, on the particular code you're writing. But human beings uh, can only think about, uh, you know, a couple of things at a time. So it's like you have blinders on. Once you start, once you get an idea and you start in it, you don't, your mind does not distract you with other nearby ideas. That's the job of the second guy. He's like the co-pilot checking the navigation. He's the one who's supposed to be thinking about whether you're really solving the right problem um, uh, whether you know, the implications for the architecture, you know, all of the larger um, um, questions. So in our example, he's the guy who's thinking out of the box and, and the guy typing is the guy who's thinking in the box, right? Now notice that nothing happens. I mean, it doesn't work if just either one, if you pick either one of them, right? If you just focus on the immediate work, then things don't go well because you get taken by surprise by things that come out of left field. If you're just thinking about the context and the various things that might happen, things don't go well because you never actually get anything done. So, so they're always like this, which in effect means you have to always work in a team of some kind, right? That just working by yourself, you, you can do it. I work by myself for most of my career, but you're extremely vulnerable to failures caused by not having the other guy or the other person we should say um, by either not getting enough focus in the immediate perspective or not having a broader uh, focus that includes the immediate perspective. And would you say that's the main argument if you have um, two people doing one job or are there other benefits of, of that? Because I could imagine some people would just say it's one job, why should I hire two people doing one job, right? Well, now you're, you're getting into the real tar pit. Uh, the question is, when someone is programming, what do you think they are doing? We might adopt a point of view, Dave Farley's point of view. He has a good book uh, about software engineering that he just uh, came out with. And so actually I can see the Toyota books behind you. It reminds me of the, of the Toyota approach. So his approach is when you start doing the work, you have to start with the assumption that you're starting um, assessment of what you're, what you're doing is going to be wrong. But you can't get away, can't get away from it. The solution is not to try to find the right approach, right? Because there is no right approach. You, you have to start doing something 
to get into a project, but you, you have to assume that once you start doing it and start learning about the project, you will find out that what you, the way you started was wrong and you need to change it. Okay, and I know it's a, Toyota has a thing about failure. Failure is the most important learning event, right? So you have to be able to recognize your failures and learn from them. Okay, so if you just have one person typing away, and I know because I did this for a long time, they don't recognize their failures. They don't see when things are not going the way they're supposed to. And they keep on working and working and working. And they might be incredibly productive. Right? But they are not producing the most important thing, which is they are not producing failures most of the time. So in, in the wisdom of old age, I would say that the job of a programmer is learning, not typing not writing code. The thing that programmers are trying to do is very complicated and hard. And so there's no way to do it really effectively unless you can learn as you go along. And from harsh experience, that means you have to have a buddy. You have to have companions. You have to have somebody to program with if you really want to be able to capture the learning as it happens. So actually two people is a, at this point is old fashioned. Um, the people who are doing mob programming like to get all the stakeholders in the room, everybody who's involved in the project. And so you might have 12 people with only one guy typing, right? but you have 12 people learning, right? So it greatly magnifies the effect. And it makes the accountant's hair stand on end. <laughs> 12 people just to have one guy typing programming? Yeah. That's oftentimes um, counterintuitive if you want to do it right and good. And That's the key. Yeah. And I think some right. Something, yes. Sorry. The right way is always counterintuitive. Yes. Otherwise, everyone would just be doing it, right? <laughs> That's so true. Well, wonderful. Ken, um, we are already at an end. So, um, when should people reach out to you? What, um, what do you have to offer? Well, my biggest interest right now, I mean, one of the observations about TOC that if you, if you do it uh, full bore, it can be uh, complicated and difficult. Um, so what, one of the things I like to uh, think about is is things people could do when their organization perhaps wasn't fit and ready to undertake a big effort like TLC that might nevertheless do some good for them and help get them get them more in a position. And uh, the thing I think most about right now and the thing I'm looking for people to try and work with is to co-opt domain-driven designs idea about a ubiquitous vocabulary. So I'm working with a client right now doing a small project, but part of the deal with him is that we would develop a ubiquitous language for the project. So with a ubiquitous language, you have the language is actually written out as a series of statements and, and then it's used for planning purposes but it also is written into the code base. So if there's a sentence, you know, saying like, um, 
you know, batches are stored in inventory somewhere in the code, there will be references to inventory and batches so that the code and the stakeholders are all speaking the same language when they're talking about the work. It's being very surprising. The developments are being very surprising. It, it changes the way I build things. It changes the client experience. And it's, it's a, a limited, narrow focus sort of thing. Could easily be combined with something like event storming. But just the idea that we have some stakeholders and we're trying to work on something. My interest right now is, is to say, I could help you develop and use a ubiquitous language in this situation. And like, you know, lubricating oil, that would make everything else work better. That, you know, lots of problems would go away. That's, that's the thrust of my attention right now is to find some, some uh, projects that I can uh, work on like that, because I think there's a lot of possibility there. Definitely. So wonderful. Thanks a lot, Ken. As usual, Michael, it's been a blast. What services um, does Blue Dolphin offer and how do they help um, your customers? And how can they get in touch with you? How can they, uh, can they get more information? Okay, what is Blue Dolphin? I think Blue Dolphin is the first and the really first uh, worldwide community of people who want to do self-organized changes based on theory of constraint. Okay, and what is this? Um, in the end, a theory of constraints is all about getting more output in a very short time without adding pressure to the people and additional resources. That's theory of constraints. And the self-organization part is um, coming to this point, even in huge organization in a very, very fast way. Um, and our aim as Dolphins is of course, to share this knowledge and make it available to as many organizations as possible around the world. So our service is being a community, exchanging ideas, exchanging experience and make this happen. Um, there are friends of Blue Dolphin, that's uh, uh, the smallest version. Uh, there you get invitations to our gatherings, you get a newsletter, you get coffee breaks, small information bites. Um, and of course you get all the support you need to get it started. And there is of course uh, a paid membership And if, if you are a paid member, then you get additionally service. You get access to the whole community, to the whole uh, network of dolphins with all their experience and knowledge how to do it. Um, there will be question and answer sessions. Um, there will be coffee breaks, even more and better ones. There will be knowledge updates if someone learns something. Um, and you get access to our whole body of knowledge. That's something around two gigabytes of data. It's books, it's PDFs, articles, um, it's small videos and, and useful links and even Excel tools to get started right away. So uh, you have access to the whole body of knowledge of the whole Blue Dolphin network. And that's very valuable, by the way. And, and the third part of course, and the third services, If you want to really get started, um, sometimes you need to convince your boss and we are helping in this. And sometimes it's a little better to have some guidance, some coaching through the Blue Dolphin process to really get your success as fast as possible. And of course, we as Blue Dolphin, we offer help in this. So we are a community uh, from the beginning to the end. Um, just to make you successful and your company. If you want to join, it's very easy. Just open browser, type in HTTPS slash slash um, blue minus dolphin dot world. And there's a contact formula. Just get in contact 
and uh, you're welcome to swim with us in the ocean as a blue dolphin. <laughs>